All right. Well, my clock is, uh, my clock, my phone is showing me 12.05. So let's go ahead and, and get started with the first of our 2022 lunchtime talks on invasive species for California Invasive Species Action Week. Um, I'm Doug Johnson with the California Invasive Plant Council or Cal IPC. And I'm joined by um, some collaborators who helped put together this week's series. Um, Randall and Julie, do you want to introduce yourselves? Hi, I'm Randall Oliver. I am the statewide communications coordinator on invasive shot hole bores, and I am with UC Agriculture and Natural Resources. Good afternoon. I'm Julie Clark. I'm community education specialist with University of California Cooperative Extension based in Ventura and working region wide on the emerging tree pests program from San Luis Obispo to the international border at Tijuana. Excellent. Um, Rhea, do you want to go ahead and stop sharing your screen? Um, thank you all for uh, being with us today and being interested. I'm going to um, end this poll in a minute, but if you haven't had a chance to answer the questions in the poll, please do that. So this uh, talk today is the first of five lunchtime talks during this week um, as part of, I believe, the fifth annual, or maybe, maybe longer than that, California Invasive Species Action Week, uh, organized centrally by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And all this week, starting last Saturday and going through next Sunday, is um, California Invasive Species Action Week. And we encourage you to visit their website, find one of the ways um, to get active, which you already have by attending today's webinar. Um, but there are local events for weed removal and watersheds and lots of other opportunities there. So thanks for being here today. Um, the California Invasive Plant Council is a nonprofit organization working with lots of partners across the state to raise awareness. Um, get good things done on the ground, and provide science-based tools for the land management community. And um, thrilled to work together with our University of California partners on um, these webinars on a range of topics. And if you've seen this week's lineup, uh, we've got all sorts of things uh, to talk about. So um, without further ado, let me end this poll um, and share the results. So it looks like um, our audience uh, is pretty darn familiar with what a psyllid is. Um, I can't say that I was, um, that I am super familiar. I do know basically what it is. Um, and some folks though who, um, you know, 20% who aren't familiar at all. So that's wonderful. Thanks for being here. And why do we can, uh, care about citrus? Um, lots of ways. We actually have um, a few professional citrus growers here, which is great. Thanks for joining. Um, but basically all of us consume citrus products or, you know, a majority of us consume citrus products. Many of us grow citrus in our own yards um, and we care about citrus farmers themselves. So um, let me introduce today's speaker. We're thrilled to have him. Um, go away. Sorry, my Zoom is, okay. Uh, Ivan Milosalovic, Molosa, although I'll let you pronounce yeah, yeah, it. <laughs> it's in the, in the ballpark. Um, so uh, Dr. Milosalovic is a supervisory project scientist in biocontrol or biological control at UC Riverside. He works on the biological control of invasive pest species that attack agricultural crops threaten wild uh, wilderness areas and degrade urban landscapes in California. Uh, he's a research affiliate for the Center for Invasive Species Research at UC Riverside. Um, and he's regularly engaged in emerging programs concerning invasive pests such as Asian citrus psyllid and Argentine ants, which are also citrus pests, a variety of sap sucking citrus pests, aphids, scales, mealybugs, psyllids, as well as palm weevils, exotic palm pests, and avocado seed weevils, exotic avocado pests, and wireworms, soil pests. We'll have to find out if the new um, jumping worms are within his realm of, of work. I don't know if the worms are new, but the newspaper articles are super new. Um, so welcome, Ivan, and uh, 
feel free to share your screen and um, give us your talk. I do want to remind everybody that you, uh, if you have questions for Ivan, please put those in the Q&A function of Zoom. If you have any technical issues or you just, <clears throat> excuse me, just want to chat with each other, you can do that in the chat function. And at the end of, um, of Ivan's talk, we'll uh, look at your questions and, and get a conversation going. All right, thanks a bunch. Take it away, Ivan. Okay, thank you, Doug. Thanks for this wonderful introduction. And thank you all for having me today to present our successful story, I guess, of a biological control that we have in California right now. Uh, before we start, the biocontrol uh, or the biological control is basically uh, using a live organism to treat another live organism that is causing a harm to environment or to uh, agricultural production or urban areas in any way. And this is what we are going to discuss today. And before we start, um, let me see this one. Sorry, but the slides are not moving. Oh, don't you love that? It all looks so good. Yes. <laughs> and it worked before. OK. You can um, re restart it if you need oh. to. Oh, Do you see it. this? OK, mm -hmm. it works. OK, before we start with everything, uh, I want to share this slide and ask this question. This is basically the question that we're going to ask today is, can California avert a citrus apocalypse? Uh, well, in short terms, yes, we can. And we have a very successful story, like I said to tell today. Like I mentioned, uh, the biggest issue is the arrival of this citrus pest known as the Asian citrus psyllid. It is a notorious citrus pest of uh, citrus crops throughout the world. Uh, it has established in pretty much everywhere in the world where citrus is grown, and it is causing a lot of headache and um, a lot of problems for uh, commercial growers and urban growers as well, or urban backyard trees. Um, as its name suggests, it is an invasive species at a very small species it is native to the um, Indian, sub, or, uh, Indian subcontinent and Southeast Asia, but it has traveled around the world and it's right in, now in California and causing a lot of problems to our citrus. Um, before we start with the pest itself, I'm just gonna move to California citrus industry. And most of you uh, actually are either consuming citrus, like you said, in, in the pool or are uh, commercially growing citrus, or you have backyard trees of citrus which is very important. Now, uh, California citrus industry has now moved to, the, to be the largest producer of citrus in the United States. Before it was Florida that was in the first place, but the arrival of this specific pest that we're gonna discuss today, the ACP has actually decimated this whole production that Florida had, and their production was reduced by even 80%, which allowed us to move into a first place. Uh, now, California is producing a lot of navels, a lot of oranges, Valencias as well, lemons, uh, but also some grapefruit and tangerines as well. And overall, it is contributing a lot of money to our economy, to the state's economy, about $7.1 billion a year. It employs a lot of people as well. Uh, most of the production, commercial production, is in the San Joaquin Valley, in the Central Valley, the central part of California, but a lot of citrus uh, a lot of urban citrus is grown in Southern California, a lot of residency, a lot of people live here and most of the residency have one, at least one citrus tree. Uh, and also we have some commercial citrus in Southern California, especially here in Riverside and the Redlands area as well. So there is a lot of stake uh, or at stake if the ACP become established and cause a lot of, it can cause a lot of damage. Uh, about 80% of our industry is being produced for fresh market purposes, and that is very specific to this pest that we're going to discuss today. Now, why worry about this small insect? Well, it is a, a very successful invader. Like I said, it uh, has all of the characteristics of a successful invader. It is a small insect. It can go undetectable, be, being moved by humans or by itself you know, on, a, on a plant material. It uh, has a very fast development cycle and it has a lot of generation. It can have a lot of generations uh, per year. Uh, it can thrive in pretty much any climate. Uh, it has established, in, like I said, in all of the citrus areas of the world. And uh, in California, California is very specific and we have a lot of invasive species because of the climate that we have here. And it's so diverse. So we have coastal areas, we have desert areas that are really hot completely different than coastal and we have some intermediate sweet spot ranges as we call them. 
so a lot of opportunity for this pest to find uh, its Goldilocks effect, basically to find its sweet spot here in, in California and to proliferate and cause a lot of damage. Uh, what is important to mention is that it thrives in California in both urban citrus and commercial citrus as well, but in very, very limited um, uh, numbers in commercial citrus. And it feeds on almost any variety of citrus plants, even the ones that you are not considering, uh, for example, that are not commercially produ produced citrus plants that are basically just looking like the garden plants, but they are in the citrus family. So it doesn't have any preference for food. Now, on its own, this pest is not causing a lot of economic damage. It is feeding on a phloem juice or a juice of a plant. It's called a phloem which is rich in sugars. Uh, and it has direct access to a plant uh, middle part, which is circulating up and down the tree trunk, right? And up or down the tree into the leaves and from the roots. Uh, while feeding, it can cause like some sort of a damage like uh, leaf curling and, and twig curling, uh, some very minor damage that is not economic. But why is it important then? Because it is the primary and the sole vector of a disease a citrus incurable disease that cannot be, like I said, cured, uh, and it can cause a lot of damage to citrus plants. And this disease is known as a Wang Long Bing, uh, but the citrus is transmitting is the sole vector of a greening bacterium known as Candidatus Liberibacter Asiaticus, or CLASS short, which is the primary agent of this disease. And the problem is that this disease can go undetectable for uh, some time, and when, it's get, when it gets uh, uh, detected, like in, so, for example, in human diseases as well, it might be too late or it is too late in this case. Uh, so uh, characteristic symptoms associated with this disease are, for example, yellowing, irregular yellowing of leaves, which can be related to zinc deficiency, for example. Uh, also, uh, if it gets affected, the plants will die in very short time, from five to 10 years, and there is nothing you can do about it at the moment. What is very of very concern as well uh, for our citrus, that most of these plants for this 10 year period will produce some sort of fruit, but the fruit will be malformed, which is unmarketable, like we said in California, because most of it is produced for fresh market purposes. Uh, the premature fruit drop, again, unmarketable in California, and also the bitter taste, again, unmarketable for fresh market production citrus, right? Now in Florida, they had some way, even though they reduced their production uh, and the number of plants significantly, they had some way of blending in the taste because most of their citrus is produced for fruit. In our case, if this pest and the disease get established in commercial citrus, and it will be catastrophic. The, the, the end part will be the catastrophic for our economy and for the citrus production as well. Now, a little bit about the development of this pet, the life stage of this pest, the vector, the ACP. Uh, like I said, the adults, uh, they're good dispersers, they're all flying. They will act like uh, flying contaminated syringes that have a disease. And they're basically the best vectors, the ones that acquire, the adults acquire the HLB or the, the greening bacterium from an infected pl plant, and it will transmit to another plant that it's not infected, like, uh, uh, and they're the best vectors. Uh, the females will produce, they're pretty fecund, they will produce a lot of uh, eggs, uh, about 750 is the estimate per, uh, per lifetime. And these eggs are laid exclusively on uh, young, very soft, immature leaves called the flush citrus leaves. And this is very important. When the eggs hatch in about just a couple of days, we will have these bottom, on the bottom part of the slide, you can see them, they're called nymphs, but they're the immature stages, the kids, sort of speaking, of the ACP. And there are five different stages. They are each different from each other uh, as they grow in size. Uh, but pretty much similar in, in, in develop, developmental characteristics. And they can develop through this stage in about two weeks and go into adult and we can have that completes the life cycle. So in just like a several weeks, we can have one generation done. And the problem is for the management options and everything that you have multiple generations of psyllids across the plants on the same plant, uh, a lot of different uh, angles to be covered. Uh, now these nymphs are very specific because they are exclusively feeding on this young, on these young leaves, on this young flush. Uh, they cannot penetrate the, the the mature leaves, only the flush. 
And that is very important because their movement is pretty limited to this citrus flush and their development. So they're very, very prone to management options, including the biocontrol that we're gonna to discuss today. Uh, a little about, about, about the invasion history of this pest, uh, or both of them, ACP and the HLP. As I said, the, their name suggests that they are native, the ACP is native to the Indian subcontinent and the Southeast Asia, which is uh, basically the, the whole range uh, for this pest. But the specific area, the possible area of origin of ACP was thought to be the northern part of uh, Indian subcontinent and some parts of uh, of a Pakistan as well, because it was first described from this, um, this part of the world uh, in uh, early 1800s. The HLB was first detected in China uh, at about the same time, and it was also, um, uh, that, that's believed to be the, the possible area of origin of the HLB, but somehow they got coibled together in this range and uh, into this uh, disease uh, transmitting machine. Uh, and since then, they have evaded pretty much, like I said, most of the world where citrus is grown. Uh, they are in Brazil. Uh, ACP was known from 1940, 1940s. Uh, then HLB came in 2004. In Florida, it was first, the ACP was first detected in 1998. And by 2000, it pretty much was present across the whole state. So when the HLB arrived in 2005, it just decimated the whole citrus industry. Uh, in California, we have a similar scenario. ACP was first found in 2008 in urban citrus and AGLB followed in 2012. And they're both currently being mostly established in, in urban areas where we live now. So uh, a little bit about the situation in California into more details. Uh, the ACP first detection was made in the San Diego County in 2008. However, uh, in 2009, the CDFA, the California Department of Food and Agriculture, uh, conducted a survey uh, in uh, Los Angeles, in LA and Orange counties and found a pretty uh, large self-sustained established population of this pest, which actually uh, taught us to believe that there are two entry points of this pest in California, one in uh, LA and Orange County and one in San Diego County. Since, since then, uh, because we have a lot of citrus, uh, urban citrus grown here, a lot of residency, it moved pretty fast. This actually, this whole area served as, a, as an invasion bridgehead for them to get established in California. And they invaded all of the counties in Southern California, all of the urban citrus as well. Uh, big populations were detected pretty soon. They moved rapidly throughout the state into a Northern part and into a San Joaquin Valley as well. But those locations that you can see uh, in green on a map, the detections are pretty sporadic or worse, pretty sporadic. And the numbers are pretty low still, which is what we wanna see. With the HLB, it was first detected in 2012. Uh, and since then about 2,100 HLB infected trees have been removed and all of them are in Southern California or were in Southern California. They were removed, destroyed. And the CDFA and the USDA, the United States Department of Food and Agriculture have imposed this quarantine that you can see in red lines that limits all the movement of citrus plant outside of this area. And this is very important because we're gonna discuss uh, like the future options uh, for the management of this pest within these areas as well, within, the, within these borders. <laughs> Uh, now, sorry, uh, I have to go back. So the first initial response was to um, uh, run uh, an insecticide, an area-wide insecticide spray program in Southern California to be able to uh, reduce the number of psyllids and reduce the number of, of the disease. Because as a disease vector, it is important to reduce their numbers. Like, for example, in mosquitoes as well is the same case. If you reduce them, their numbers to low enough numbers, the incidence of the disease will also be reduced. So the initial response was to run this pesticide spray program across the whole Southern California. And it really didn't work because we have millions of millions of people, tens of millions of people living in this area. Uh, a lot of residencies, like I said, a lot of urban citrus grown in each residency. So a lot of area had to be covered, a lot of permits to be obtained to go into every single backyard and treat every single tree. And the program was just unmanageable uh, and uneconomical and it was abandoned in less than a year. So we needed something more sustainable to manage this pest and disease in, in Southern California and limit their spread into a, a commercial citrus. And that is the, 
sorry, the development of a classical biological control program. Uh, I'm just gonna briefly touch what this program means. Uh, it means that you're using, again, biological control, a live organism, but in this case, classic, classical means that you're using a live organism from the pest's native range, which is the Indian subcontinent in this case. You're bringing this new uh, good guys, these new good guys into a new environment such as California. You're doing a lot of different tests and finally, you're using them to control the pests. You're reuniting them into this new environment, such as California, to treat them effectively in this new, 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 new range as their control in the native range. So here I have listed all of the program details or steps that need to be followed. A lot of them, I'm not going to go into a lot of details. Uh, but for this program, basically, uh, we had to go, um, Dr. Hoddle, uh, had to go, uh, which is the head of our lab, had to go to uh, Punjab, Pakistan, Punjab area of Pakistan, which has a very good climate match with Southern California. Uh, they brought a lot of material associated with the ACP, uh, and they reared out a lot of good guys from this material into a quarantine. They had to bring the, the material into a quarantine because you cannot just release it in, into this new environment because it might cause a lot of more damage than good to this new environment. Uh, so a lot of testing have been done in the quarantine facility, which is double cage, triple door system. There is no way they can escape. Uh, most of it, it's in a dark. Uh, so their, their movement outside of this quarantine facility is very uh, not manageable at all. Uh, and uh, after a lot of this testing that need to be done, how specific they are to this pest, this ACP, uh, will they cause a lot of different uh, environmental problems for California if they are being released? Uh, and after all of this data is being collected in a quarantine and some of the good guys are being identified, then you have to submit the, uh, your, uh, all of the data for approval to the USDA and the CDFA to obtain a special permit that you can release these new good guys into California. And that's exactly what we did. And I'm probably going to touch more basis on the final two steps that you see here in yellow, and that is when you release them. Uh, how effective they are. You have to monitor them, their impact and how effective they are in, in Southern California, in this case, in this new environment against the ACP. So uh, these are the two organisms that we're gonna explain today, the Tamarixia radiata uh, or the TR and the Diaphorin serrata allegarhensis or, or the DA. So I'm just gonna refer to them from now on as TR and DA because it will be much easier. Uh, they are the two good guys that we have identified from this uh, material brought from Pakistan, and they're also used against the ACP in different areas of the world where biocontrol is being used. Uh, they are parasitoids. So I'm just going to explain that. There are three P's in biological control. You have a parasitoid, uh, which is uh, basically an organism that is much smaller, in this case wasp, than the host, the ACP, the pest organism. It is using a host or ACP as, uh, as if you have seen the alien movie, it pretty much resembles that whole biology. So it lays eggs inside the host or outside the host and the larva of this wasp will use this new organism to develop, eat it up from the inside out and emerge as a new wasp. So it's pretty much the same as alien movie. Uh, the predators, the other P, the second P, they're much bigger than their host and they're using them only for food, as a food source, not for development as parasitoids. And then we have a third P, the three P, uh, is uh, the pathogens that we're not going to discuss today. They are not insect organism. Today we're going to discuss the parasitoids, these two wasps, and also some predators later. Uh, but like I said, they're parasitoids, they're pretty specific to ACP, exclusively specific to ACP, and uh, they're not causing any harm to humans. They're very small, one to two millimeters in size. Uh, they will not cause any harm to the environment as well. Now, even though they're both parasitoids, they're different species, they have different biologies. Now, the TR is the ectoparasitoid, which means that it lays eggs on the outside of its host, in this case, below the ACP uh, nymph, uh, and the larva will develop into adult to eat it up from the inside out and come on, on the back part of a nymph. Now, the DA is, uh, has a different biology, it's an endoparasitoid, which means that it lays eggs inside its host and the larva will develop inside and again emerge through the back portion of the body. 
what is very important to say that both of these nymphs, or uh, both of these wasps, sorry, are um, very specific. They are nymph parasitoids, which means that they are attacking nymphal stages of ACP, not the adults, not the eggs, but nymphs. And it is believed that, uh, it was believed that they can coexist and do a lot of damage together, a combined damage to ACP in California because they're used, they're present in the native range. They're doing a lot of damage to ACP over there. They have been used in different biological control programs, like I mentioned, and uh, both of them are contributing in some of those programs. Uh, but also they don't have a shared preference for the nymphal instars. Basically, uh, Tamarixia will, uh, or TR will uh, prefer or kill larger nymphs, while DA will uh, kill or uh, feed on or lay eggs on, on a smaller nymphs. So there is no uh, shared preference. There is no different. There is a difference in biology. So we all assume that they will work together and uh, collectively contribute to the ACP control in California. And we'll see if that's the case. Uh, I'm going to start with the TR first. Uh, the TR was the first to be released in 2011 in Southern California, and since then, about 23 million TR agents had been released across Southern California at more than 19,000 different locations or release sites as we call them. Now, the initial response after those first initial releases was to evaluate, is TR doing any good for us in California? Uh, below in the right corner of a slide, you can see that it pretty much established across the whole area. Uh, we have investigated about 100 different locations where it hadn't been released. Uh, and at all of these locations, actually at 91% of these locations, this TR was established, which is great, which is what we want to see. It is doing good in California. It likes the climate. It is producing its offspring or a youngs, and it just loves it here. But the study that evaluated the impacts of, of a TR in Southern California on ACP populations uh, that was done from 2012 to two, two, through 2014 actually uh, found that the ACP numbers over these two years have declined by 75%, which was really good. This is what we wanted to see. But the TR effect was not found at all. Uh, the parasitism rates were low. But in some cases, at some locations, uh, it was found to be very high. Now, this particular study was done uh, across uh, a intermediate range, a sweet spot that we, was, we were thinking it was for the ACP. And it might be the case that it was not doing any good because of that or just because of a, of a, a early program development. So we did the same study about like uh, from 2015 through 2019. I'm gonna go into that in, in just a couple of slides. But before then, we actually wanted to see who is doing a good job for the ACP biocontrol in California. And two subsequent studies were done, a smaller scale studies were done, one from uh, in 2014. And this was basically uh, an exclusion studies, exclusion study, sorry, where uh, we wanted to see who is doing the damage to ACP. And based on this study, we have found that TR was one of the contributors, but also uh, some of the good key players in the game were the hoverflies, the surfeit fly larvae, some of the good flies that we can see in our gardens, uh, and also the lacewings, the, the green lacewings that you can see on your lamps, uh, uh, usually at night uh, coming to the lamps, but their larvae are pretty voracious and they're eating a lot of different uh, pests as well, including the ACP in California. So all of these three uh, organisms were contributing to a biocontrol of ACP in our experiments. Uh, and we have seen about 55 to 95 uh, reduction of ACP reproduction at all of these uh, plants. And what we were doing is artificially infesting the plants uh, with the ACP nymphs. We were putting them inside the commercial orchards and we were observing them during daytime for several hours a day across different uh, seasons as well. Now, the problem is that we did a snapshot of, um, of just the counts or visual observations of these good guys on uh, ACP nymphs uh, inside the citrus. What we wanted to see if what is going on during the daytime throughout the day and what is going during nighttime as well. To do that, we uh, did uh, uh, another study in 2015, a similar study with artificially infested plants with ACP nymphs, 
but we were videotaping them uh, throughout day and night for multiple days, multiple weeks as well. And this study found the same effect or same, it just confirmed our results from the previous study that hoverflies and uh, lacewings were the sole or the most important key players in the game. And also the TR was contributing as well. So collectively these three organisms actually reduced again by 90% ACP NIMS uh, on our plants. Uh, and the other players like coccinellid larvae uh, or coccinellids, the ladybugs or some uh, spiders that are predatory did not feed on ACP. They were present, but they did not feed on ACP NIMS. Uh, the most important thing that we found as well was a uh, very high abundance of uh, Argentine ants that we're gonna discuss. And whenever the ants were present, uh, the abundance of natural enemies was reduced, which triggered the alarm in our case. And it will be the topic of, our, of the second part of our discussion today. Uh, and like I mentioned, we did another impact study in, from 2015 through 2019 uh, a similar one to the one that we initially did, but we covered more of an, of an area. We covered all of the uh, like 30, 30, 30 locations across coastal sites, intermediate sites and desert areas as well, and across four years. And this study actually confirmed that TR is doing a good job against ACP in uh, California. And it is contributing to a program a lot. Basically on this slide, on, on this graph, you can see the ACP numbers in white, they decreased at pretty much all of the locations by 75%. And this is what we wanna see. We wanna reduce the ACP numbers and reduce the incidence of HLP. But also you can see on this slide, and this is the holy grail of biological control basically, that each time the ACP numbers peaked, the TR numbers will peak as well. They will follow. Uh, and this is called the density dependent reduction of ACP NIMS over time. And TR was the main contributor at these locations. And these are all non-release TR locations where it established uh, on its own. Uh, what we have found again in this site is that the presence of Argentine ants will reduce again the TR parasitism by 50% uh, every time the Argentine ants were present. So again, uh, a cause for concern. Uh, we, the results were satisfactory, but a cause for concern about the Argentine ants was made. So I talked a lot about the TR, but uh, really where is DA? Uh, DA was also released in California. It was used in other programs. And this is one of my initial programs when I arrived to UCR was to evaluate the impacts of this pest or of this wasp, sorry in, in uh, Southern California. It was first released in 2014. Uh, about 750,000 agents or DA agents were released until 2019 at 300 different location. Uh, we covered pretty much the whole area, but it was very hard to find a spot where TR was not established to limit the competitiveness of these two wasps against each other and to give it a time basically to establish in this new area. Uh, and, a subsequent study, initial study after the program development found that the DA was not doing anything good. It was just the, the numbers were really low, 0.5% parasitism overall, which is unsatisfactory. Again, at all of the locations that we have selected for this work have found that TR was established already and was doing a good job. Uh, and pretty much anywhere in the world where TR uh, was evaluated against the DEA, it has shown that it will just exclude it. It's a superior competitor. It has a faster developmental cycle. And even though they do not share the same host, it will just eat up the whole DEA uh, larva that it's inside. The larva with TR will eat it up. The females are pretty much uh, very aggressive towards the DEA females that want to lay eggs inside the ACP. And the low rate of establishment and the high production costs associated with the production of DA in California led us to a conclusion that we have to cancel this program. And it was just abandoned in 2019, pretty, pretty fast and DA is not being used anymore. We're solely uh, focused on releases of a TR here. Uh, so what's new about this is that the release strategy has shifted uh, in some way since the initiation of a classical biological control program in 2010. The first releases up until 2014, I believe, uh, were focused uh, mostly on um, 
on uh, patchy releases across the whole area. It was unsystematic, uh, but this is what we needed. This was the initial response. In 2014, the CDFA and the USDA have developed a uh, one mile square grid layer system, basically a layer of a lot of squares, each one mile square in size that you can lay across the whole area of Southern California. And it was laid across the whole area. And basically the releases were made in every single uh, grid that you can see on a map. And they were pretty systematic across the whole area and produced a lot of the good results that we saw previously. Now in 2017, a focus has shifted towards the areas of uh, where the AGLP founds were made. Uh, most of them in, in five counties in Southern California and where the quarantine borders are being established. Uh, and uh, as of 2017, most of these uh, releases are focused on these areas of high risk uh, of HLB incidents or presence. Uh, they're based on heat maps that you can see in the right bottom corner that USDA has developed. Basically, the darker the red, the area, the higher the chance of HLB will be detected. Uh, and all of these releases are now uh, focused mainly inside these boundaries and across also the roads that are uh, connecting, for example, Riverside and Redlands where citrus is being produced and also where uh, a lot of the agricultural equipment is being moved, such as, for example, the 90 wide freeway. So we're hoping that this shift in a strategy will have more focused on reducing the HLB incidents within these borders, as well as the ACP numbers, because outside of the borders, there is no HLB and the numbers have decreased as well. So with that, I'm just gonna end the classical biological control program with the wasps. And I'm gonna to shift to our main problem, uh, which are the Argentine ants. Uh, and as their name suggests, they're also not native. They're another invasive species that we're gonna to discuss today. Uh, they, are, uh, they originate from the basin of the Parana River in Argentina, uh, as their name suggests. Uh, they're pretty aggressive ants. Uh, they, they can form a super colony uh, and all of the ants, uh, so since they were first found in Parana River, they have moved pretty much by a human assistance or without it into uh, a lot of different areas in the world, including the Mediterranean area and the Japan, for example. And I'm mentioning this because they are forming a super colony, a mega colony. Uh, and if you combined the colony, like a one nest from California and put it together with a nest from uh, Mediterranean area and with a nest from Japan, they will not kill each other. They will work together and they'll form another colony. So this is very important. This is very unique for ant uh, world where most of these colonies will compete with each other. And it is not the case in, in, the, in the Argentine ant case. They will work together wherever they are in the world and they will, they're pretty aggressive. They will exclude pretty much all of the other ants that are competing for the same food and they will exclude also the natural enemies. Now, the problem is, is because they have formed the food for protection mutualisms, as we call them with these uh, sap sucking pests. Basically, the, all of the pests that are feeding on uh, phloem sap uh, or, uh, or juices or juices that produce a lot of sugar, and these ants are a sugar feeding ants, uh, they're pooping sugar, uh, which you can see here in a photo of a, uh, of a white strings. Basically, this is just a sugary poop, as we call it. Uh, and uh, they like to eat this. And in return, they will protect these their herds from anything that interferes with them. Uh, so they're causing a lot of problems to uh, Tamarixia, as you can see in this program, or TR. It will, they will just exclude them, as well as the other natural enemies. So how bad are they in our citrus orchards? Well, uh, most of the nests are below the trees. They have a lot of nests, a lot of queens that are interconnected. Uh, about 90% of SoCal and coastal orchards are infested with Argentine ants. In California, they like our climate, Southern California pretty much covered by Argentine ants and all of the coastal counties as well, all the way through Oregon as well. So they're causing a lot of issues. They're pre present pretty much anywhere. Uh, some of the trees can have a lot of different numbers, a lot of high numbers, sorry, and even millions and millions of ant visits per day. 
uh, they're protecting about 90% of all the sap sucking feeding pests, such as the ACP, the mealybugs, the aphids, uh, other psyllids, uh, scales, whatever is producing that sugary poop, they will come and protect it from whatever it interferes with their food. And in, in our case, the ACP, about more than 55 of ACP colonies are being protected by these ants across the whole area. And that is a problem, right? In terms of a parasitism rates, as you can see, I'm just gonna run the video of Tamarixia or TR trying to uh, lay eggs on the ACP nymphs. The ants will come right away, excluded from these colonies, take it to the nest and eat it up and feed the queens. Uh, the ants, uh, the numbers are pretty much very straightforward. You can see them. If, if the trees have ants, the parasitism will be as low as 12%. If the trees are lacking ants, the parasitism will be above 90%. Pretty straightforward. If you have ants, you're going to have a problem. If you don't have ants, you're not going to have a problem for the biological control. Uh, and the, some of the action thresholds that have been developed based on the, these numbers for the control of these ants, then it will be important for our future discussion or further discussion, is that anything below 20 to 80 uh, ants that you can see on a tree trunk moving up and down the tree trunk uh, will uh, have uh, a good effect on biocontrol, but everything above that uh, will impede the biocontrol whatever you're trying to do against the ACP or other pests that you see in your orchard. So this is the current system that we're trying to develop to effectively monitor, control, monitor these ants. If they go above the threshold, we need to control them. And when we control them and they go below the threshold again, then we can use something to enhance the biocontrol. And in this case, some flowering plants that I'm gonna discuss, and it's called the conservation biological control that I'm gonna explain later. Uh, but these three components, we have evaluated them very uh, thoroughly, uh, each, uh, every single one of them separately, uh, but combined, we are, we are trying to combine them now together and develop an IPM program for the ants and for the sap sucking pests as well in citrus orchards. So, um, like I said, the, the best, the most effective way of uh, uh, estimating the density of these ants on your trees or the threshold is to count them visually on a tree trunk. Uh, now you have to go below the tree trunk as some of them have very sh sharp spikes. You can hurt your back. It causes a lot of issues. It's labor intensive and it is focused on a couple of minutes during the daytime. Uh, what we have found is that these ants love, especially in commercial citrus where we have a lot of them, they love irrigation pipes and they use them to move between the trees and they use them as super highways because they're so smooth. There is nothing interfering with their movements and they're freely moving from tree to tree. Most of the nests, like I said, with the queens, the workers, everything is below the trees, uh, but um, between the trees, they use irrigation pipes to move. And what we have found, we have evaluated the numbers uh, on a tree trunks and the numbers on the pipes. And we have found about eight, more than 85 positive relationship between the ants moving along the pipes and the number of ants moving up and down to a tree to get their food. So there is a very strong relationship and between the ants that are moving on the pipes and on the tree trunks. And this has led us to develop these IoT for ant monitoring or infrared sensors that you see on the left side of the photo. Uh, basically they're doing all the counts for us and they're doing it very effectively day and night uh, for months, days, weeks, months. And they are GPS located within the orchard. So uh, you can see which part of the orchard is the most problematic and needs control and control and it is uh, in that way it is more sustainable and more um, focused on the areas of orchard that have problem whereas just spraying the whole orchard which is unsustainable and is not environmental friendly so uh, all of the end sensors are connected to the gateway basically the antenna uh, that transmits the real life or real uh, real-time data in onto your uh, cloud-based app uh, and uh, from a phone or from a computer, you can see the heat map, as you can see it below on the lower part of the slide, um, that uh, you can see a different numbers of ants uh, across the area and across different sensors, across different parts of the orchard, and which this can lead you to a, a management option or control option. If they go across 
uh, that threshold that we have seen, then you need the management. So for this, we have developed a very effective management options for the citrus growers uh, in a form of a miniatures, miniature bait stations, basically. They are made of a food grade material. They're called the biodegradable hydrogel beads. They're made of a sodium alginate and they're made of a calcium chloride and something that you can buy in a store and mix them together and make uh, jelly beans. Uh, when you make a jelly bean, what we are doing, we're infusing them with a sugary water and, and slub sugar, so that will attract the ants, but we are also infusing them with, uh, lacing them with a very small amount of pesticide or insecticide. Uh, it's 0.001% of a total allowed rate. Uh, of a whole spray program against this pest. So basically it's very controlled, it is very environmentally friendly and it's very targeted approach. So whichever area needs a control, you can just put them below the tree, uh, the ants will come, get parts of a, of a bead in their mouth, bring it to the colony, back to the colony, to the queens, feed the queens, the queens will die, the colony will collapse and this is exactly what we wanna see and the numbers will go below those action thresholds. Uh, and what we have found so far in commercial citrus is that the two chemicals are working very fine against the high densities of ants. And those are the thymethoxam and uh, also organically approved spinosad as well that you can put inside the beads and they will reuse the numbers effectively for you. Hey, now, Ivan, Ivan let, me, um, let me jump in quickly just to note the time. Um, we can we can certainly go over for those that can stay, but um, okay. we're, um, I think maybe now, in, unless you have like one more slide, now would be a good time perhaps to pause for questions. Uh, I just have this one more slide and conclusions and we can Perfect. jump to questions if you're okay. Okay, Excellent. so when we monitor the ants, when we, the ants go above the threshold, we control them, they go below the threshold uh, and uh, then we can employ or we can apply the biocontrol options, right? We can intru introduce the parasitoids, we can release the natural enemies, but we can also attract them to something that they like. And that's called the conservation biocontrol. Uh, basically what we have found that they love flowering plants. They need flowering plants. They need the nectar for their development, for egg development, and uh, also as a shelter. So we're providing them with the additional shelter, additional food source in citrus environments, especially commercial citrus that are bare lands. If you increase the flower diversity, we will increase the fauna diversity as well. And something that we have found is that the buckwheat and the lysum, both of those uh, are flowering really, really well, two times per year. And especially during times when these parasitoids and predators are most active in, in spring and fall. And they will increase uh, the egg laying as well as the abundance on ACP numbers. This is what we have found so far, uh, which we want. So we want to monitor the ants, control them below the numbers, and then enhance the biocontrol. And combined, we hope they will have a, a great effect on ACP and other setup sucking pests in California. So like I said, with that, I would just like to conclude that the biocontrol program is successful. We have found a, de a significant decline in ACP numbers in urban areas. Uh, the ACP and HLB have not moved aggressively into commercial or orchards in the San Joaquin Valley. The Argentine ants are causing a lot of problems, but we're trying to uh, eliminate these problems by developing an IPM uh, sustainable program for these ants. And with that, I would just like to thank all of these people that I'm working with or have worked with on these projects. And uh, okay, we can go into questions, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Not a problem. Great presentation, thank you. Um, uh, Julie and Yuta, Nikki, anybody want to um, pose some of the top questions we have in the Q&A? I was gonna, we have, we have 13 questions and I was gonna go down the list, but considering time, I don't think, it doesn't look like there is a particular theme in the questions. So um, should we just start from the top? Sure. Yeah, I'm gonna paraphrase the first question from Carolyn. Um, she said that um, she, she was concerned about a sweet orange tree that she had and, and state inspector came by to took samples. Um, the tree has recovered and she never heard from the state inspector and, and it's her understanding that no news is good news. Is that your experience once trees are inspected? Uh, I would say so, yes. Yeah, if they're inspected then there is no uh, 
cause of a concern. If there is a cause of concern, they will be all over it, trust me. So uh, especially the CDFA, they're pretty aggressive against the HLV in particular. So whenever the tree is found, it has to be removed and the whole area has to be sprayed around it. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's what they do. So if I would say yes, if, if it, it, no news is a good news in this case. Okay, and Olivia uh, would like some clarification from your uh, from one of your slides on the mm -hmm. ACP HLB distribution slide. Uh, okay. What do what do the red stars signify in Northern California? On your oh, the red stars. It was just that those were the most recent. Sorry, I didn't explain the, the most recent founds in in uh, the Bay Area and the Sacramento area. So it moved. Uh, fast across Southern California. It moved also into a Northern California and the most recent ones were found in the Bay Area and the Sacramento area. Okay, and her- but the are, Oh, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, it's just that they're pretty sporadic still over there. And whenever they find, find them, they eliminate them pretty fast. So it, the numbers are extremely lower compared to what we, are, we were seeing in, in Southern California. Okay, and in the second part and last part of her question is, uh, on the map, are the do the red circles in Southern California signify current quarantine areas? Yes, yes, that is correct. It's a quarantine area where movement outside of citrus plants outside of this area is restricted or very prohibited. So uh, it's something that they are very strict about and uh, they're trying to limit any movement uh, if possible, and to treat the area for the HLB and ACP as we saw in releases. Now the releases are primarily focused on these areas to even more reduce the incidence of HLB if possible. Okay, good. So in the chat, I added the link to the CDFA website where they talk about the quarantine zones. Is that the best place for people to go, Ivan, or is there something else you'd recommend? Uh, yeah, uh, so which site, sorry, but the CDFA? Is CDFA. That you, yes, that is the most current one and the best, best, uh, definitely, thank you. That's the best option to go and see uh, in inform about the new founds and the quarantine restrictions and ACP and HLB both. Okay. All right. Thanks, Randall, for posting that. Um, Thank you. Next, next question from Ricky: Are you able to determine from field data if the host feeding by Tamarixia has also had a positive impact on local ACP population reduction or ACP biocontrol success in general? So uh, yeah, I didn't want to go into a lot of details about the host feeding. Uh, yeah, and thank you for the question. Uh, it is it is very specific to uh, a lot of parasitoids. Uh, they need the nectar, but they also tend to just probe a nymph uh, and basically puncture it with the the thing that they are laying eggs and just suck up the all of the juice of the nymphs as well. And it has been found for many parasitoids that this host feeding, including the TR is contributing a lot to a biocontrol uh, or to a ACP re reduction of ACP numbers in this case. Uh, so uh, we, it was pretty hard to, to evaluate because uh, most of the material you would bring to the lab and uh, just evaluate visually. So uh, when they feed, it's pretty hard to detect which ones were fed on and which ones were not. Uh, so it is contributing, we know it is, based on all of the lab studies they did uh, with TR, uh, but it's simply unquantified. It's not unquantifiable, but it's uh, very hard to quantify it in the field. And uh, it's something that it's very hard to detect when you're doing these surveys. So uh, we know that it is contributing, uh, and also most of the predators, the big the big guys, uh, at, they're pretty much, they were present in those locations where TR was evaluated. They could also reduce the parasitism as well because they, some of them like coccinellids, like ladybugs or the surface fly larvae, they will eat the nymphs that already have the egg of TR inside them or outside them, sorry. So, or the larva inside. So they will reduce the already parasitized uh, ACP NIMS, uh, which can also lower the numbers as well. So we are pretty happy what we saw that uh, the, the numbers were pretty high, even with just evaluating the parasitism, but also like, like Ricky mentioned, the, the host feeding and also the 
we call it intradural predation, basically the predation by other big guys or eating up the larvae that already have TR may also lower those numbers that we saw. Uh, they might be higher than they, they are uh, on that slide and in our studies. So I would okay. go with that. Thank you. Okay, and then we and, have three and questions. Julie, Julie yes. let me just inter interrupt for a sec. Um, it is uh, one o'clock. If you need to leave, you of course are, are free to do so, but um, uh, Ivan has time to answer questions for yep. another 15 minutes or so. So um, we sure. will carry on, um, but thank you for attending. Uh, and uh, if you need to leave, feel free. Otherwise we'll, we'll be keeping going. All right, carry on, Julie, thanks. Okay, and we have three, three forthcoming questions that are kind of fall into the same uh, topic. So I'm going to amalgamate them. Um, there are questions about um, biocontrol. I know you spoke about the, the trial or the research, um, but is there is there anything that um, homeowners or farmers can do now as can they make their own remedies or um, or can they, um, is, is there anything available to them at this time? Um, what I would say you can, uh, I'm not sure if TR uh, is commercially available. Maybe some companies are producing them now for releases. I'm not sure about that. I think they are. Uh, so, but the best option will be to, uh, if you have ants, you have to treat for them. Uh, of course, these ants are not a problem always, but they are a problem in this case when they have a food that we are trying to control. Uh, so I would say uh, if you have ants, control them uh, and then plant as many buckwheat and alyssum or something flowering to attract a lot of the good guys into your garden. For example, uh, like we said, alyssum and buckwheat will attract the hoverflies and uh, a lot of hoverflies, not all of them, but uh, will come to flowering plants. They, they love flowers for nectar and they will lay eggs and you will have larvae. So basically you're having a, a sustainable way of managing uh, the pest. Uh, I, I don't see any other option aside from those two. If you have ants, you have to control them. Uh, if you don't have ants, maybe either buy TR if you're concerned, or maybe plant a lot of uh, uh, a lot of flowering plants that will attract the good guys that will reduce your numbers in your garden or your yard. Good. And so, Argentine ants. Are, is there any other species of ants that, that is of concern, or is that uh, far and beyond the, the primary pest and threat? Uh, I would say for, for commercial citrus and for citrus in general, they are the biggest problem. Uh, they're also, uh, they're, like I said, if they're present, they are pretty much, they will, uh, if something is interfering with their food, they will uh, eliminate them as well. Uh, so uh, we haven't seen any other ants. If Argentine ants are present, we haven't seen any other species, even in, in commercial orchards. So basically they will just exclude them and uh, run across the whole place. Uh, so they will keep it as their own. So okay. I think they're the most problematic right now for, uh, for, for the citrus growers, let's say that that have problems with the ACP. I'm not gonna say that they're problem, they're not problematic if you don't have uh, the, the pests because they, they're not interfering with anything. They're just around. They might be a nuisance, but they're not a, a big problem to economic threat, which the, the, best, the biggest problems are the sap sucking pests in the canopy and the ants are just helping them to thrive. Okay, great. Did you One of our attendees also just posted in the chat um, a link to uh, uh, a piece by uh, UC IPM uh, about management of citrusillid and long on being disease. So that's okay. another resource to look at. Okay, thank you. Did, Ivan, did you see any change in ACP paratis, paratis, parasitism yeah. levels by Tamarixia after control of Argentina land? Uh, that's what we are trying to evaluate now. Uh, there are some initial studies that have seen uh, uh, a high, uh, uh, lower numbers of pests. Uh, and I'm not sure, they, they, have, they have been done by a PhD student in our lab, Kelsey. Uh, and she briefly touched the basis on parasitism as well. And I think that she saw some increase in parasitism rates as well. Uh, but what we are doing right now is 
exactly that. We are evaluating the test numbers and the parasitism and predation rates as well in our trials. So that's something that we're right now evaluating all three programs combined or all three separate programs combined into an IPM. And we are evaluating the numbers of all of those pests that I mentioned and also the parasitism rates and the predation rates of different national enemies. So we're hoping to see that because the, the numbers of pests that, that has been doc documented the, uh, by Kelsey that they will go down. Uh, the parasitism rate, I think she, I'm not familiar, but I think she did this, uh, a brief snapshot of parasitism rates and she saw them, did they go up? But uh, right now we're trying to elaborate on that and confirm those findings. Okay. Um, have you tried any kind of, of physical control for Argentine ants besides the, the chemical, like a, somebody uses a suggestion of a shock treatment along metallic, metallic pipe lines? Uh, like, that's a great question. So yeah, that, that is uh, one of our grants right now. Um, so uh, like I said, they, li they like the, uh, the smooth areas, right? The irrigation pipes, uh, as soon as the area is uneven, for them, it causes the reduction in their movement by even 40, 50%. So uh, traditionally people were using mulch uh, and that's what we try to evaluate now as well, uh, but not all sorts of mulch. Some of them will have the ants proliferate. We want something that is really causing them problems like a good grade mulch that will reduce their uh, speed across the pipes. And we hope to see an effect of that. Uh, as far of a, a sharp pipes, yeah, we are doing some kind of a 3D printed uh, evaluation of different, um, different pipes, basically. Une we're trying to make them not smooth, but uneven. So to see if there is gonna be something that can be applied across the pipes that will reduce their speed and movement between the trees. So yeah, that's a good question. And it's probably someone that knows what we're doing right now. Okay, and, and a question about, have you um, in your trial um, about controlling the, the, ant, the Argentine ants, have you um, noticed the effect or tracked the effect on native ants of the bait? bait? No, they pretty much recruit pretty fast. And once they recruit, they will remove the, anything that tries to go into the beads. So they will be all over. We're not putting a lot of beads. It's, it's like 20, 150 grams per tree. Uh, and that's not a lot of the amount. Basically they will cover it as soon as it, it's on the ground in like a minute or two, they will be all over it. So there will be no chance for other ends to, to get uh, near to the food source. And especially because they're dominant to begin with, right? Exactly, yes. So, but we, we hope to see, we, we hope to do actually some studies next year to evaluate uh, if there are any other side effects on larger animals. Uh, there were studies before, but they haven't found anything. We just want to confirm that for our citrus as well. Okay. Ivan, there's several questions about the hydrogel beads. Is there some place people can get more information about those? Um, Probably uh, right now we are developing a web page, but we are we are going to publish. Uh, there is some available, like in the form of a research articles. Uh, there are some citrograph articles that are uh, uh, done by Hoddle, Dr. Hoddle, and the Kelsey that I mentioned that she worked previously on ants. Uh, she she went for Berkeley for for another position, but while while she was in our lab, she was working mostly on ants. Uh, and she, uh, she has two citrograph articles that I think are available uh, online freely. So uh, they can look them up. Basically they have the biodegradable hydrogel beads or harnessing the hydrogels in a fight against the, uh, the Argentine ants, something like that is entitled. So they can look it up over there. Those are the initial trials with thymatoxin. We have done some trials last year and this year with the spinosad, like I mentioned, in organic citrus, and it is working really good as well. Uh, but those data are not available yet. Uh, the CAPCA article will be available in October on those results as well. So uh, maybe try with Citrograph or some web pages or the CAPCA in October, and they will have uh, a better glimpse of what we found in our trials. Okay. We, we still have a few more questions. Are you available? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, ha, has the psyllid or, 
or HLB and HLB established in any wild Rutaceae species? Mm, that's a good question. Not that I know of, not that we have investigated. So I'm not sure. I'm not going to say no, but I'm not sure. Okay. Um, getting back to one of your slides, the, the shift in TR release strategy. Okay. Uh, I can only see a half of it. Do you see all of them or? I can only see half as well, but but it's a general okay. question about what do the green dots signify? Uh, I uh, so the the green dots. I think they're. Uh, I'm not uh, sure, but I think they are like uh, the the most. Uh, they had more releases compared to the gray dots. There will be, and then the red dots. They have even more. So it's just the uh, the number of released wasps uh, or agents per that site. Okay, and um, will will California native buckwheat attract hoverflies? Um, California native, yes, yeah, it will. Okay, any any harm to non-target insects with the hydrogel beads? As a non-target, is that what you said? Sorry. Yes. Uh, yeah. So yeah, that's what I mentioned. We want to evaluate that to confirm. Uh, they did oh. some of it uh, with different types of gels, uh, and uh, they didn't ha they didn't find a lot because the Argentinates, like I said, will recruit pretty fast. So we were hoping to do the same thing with our gels in citrus because they will have. I, I I'm not sure uh, if they did. I I think they did something with. Uh, the off-target effects in uh, they were using them in um, vine grapes, maybe in some citrus as well, but they didn't have uh, a lot of, uh, they didn't find a lot of off-target effects. So we're hoping to find the same thing in um, in, in this case. Uh, they are different than polyacrimid gels, poly, polyacrimid gels. They, uh, these gels, the hydro biodegradable hydrogels, they will uh, biodegrade in just a few days. Uh, whereas the uh, polyacrimid, they, they need about a week or, or more to, to biodegrade. So it's, it's more sustainable to use the biodegradable hydrogel beads compared to those. They have less time to have off-target effects, I would say. So Cal Epsi is gonna have to use this line for another call that they're doing in, in just a minute or two, but any uh, concluding comments that you wanna make, Ivan? Um, well, I'm pretty happy with what, what we have found so far uh, and about this is one of the rare examples of a classical biological control program that actually is showing some good results. So I'm happy about the whole program. It was a pleasure to work with all the agencies. Uh, like I said, we're going to continue the fight against the Argentine ants and see if we can win. Uh, I don't think we can, but we can we can certainly do uh, the most we can. So basically that's it. And I, especially I would really appreciate uh, the, the, the whole call to present our research today by the Cal, a, a Cal IPC, sorry, and the UC Division of Agricultural and Natural Resources. And thank you one more time for inviting me to present this talk. And I hope the, the, the viewers enjoy the talk as well. So if they have questions, they can most certainly uh, get me in my email, ivanm at ucr.edu and ask further questions if they have, for sure. Perfect, perfect. Thank you, Ivan. Yeah, we pasted that into the, the chat, so folks have that. But again, um, ivanm at ucr.edu. Yes, that's nice correct. And, nice and short. Thanks for a, a great presentation and kicking off the week. And thank you to Randall thank and you. Julie for, for handling the, the questions in the chat. Um, please do follow up with Ivan if you have any other uh, questions on this important issue, and we'll hope to see you the rest of the week at some of the uh, follow-up webinars. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank Take you. care. Have a good week. Bye-bye.